Uh, let me begin by extending a very warm welcome on St. Mungo's Day uh, to this uh, latest in this series of lectures and then the life and significance of Glasgow as a city. But even although this is a happy day and a significant event, it's with great sadness uh, that we need to record the sudden death earlier today of the most Reverend Philip Tertalia, Archbishop and Metropolitan of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Glasgow at his home here. Archbishop Tertalia was 70 years of age and had served as Archbishop in Glasgow since 2012. He was actually born in Glasgow on the 11th of January um, 1951, so he'd only just uh, attained uh, the um, three score years and ten mentioned in scriptures. Uh, Philip Tertalia studied for the priesthood at the Pontifical Scots College and at the Pontifical Gregorian uh, University in the Eternal City of Rome. Ordained a priest on the 30th of June 1975, Philip Tertalia thereafter returned to Rome to study for his doctorate in sacred theology before assuming various parish roles, along with leadership and teaching roles in seminaries in Glasgow and Scotland and in Rome. On the 20th of November 2005, he was ordained Bishop of Paisley in St Mirren's Cathedral by my co-trustee Archbishop Mario Conti, whom he was later to succeed as Archbishop in Glasgow. Appointed on the 24th of July 2012, Philip Tartaglia was installed at St Andrew's Cathedral in Glasgow on Saturday the 8th of September 2012, which happened to be the Feast of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We ask those who are able to do so to please pray for the repose of the soul of Archbishop Philip, for his family and friends, and for the people of his archdiocese, whose roots go back to the very beginnings of this city. On an occasion such as this, the annual Molin Diner Lecture, we would ordinarily be proud and honoured to meet in person under the aegis of the Lord Provost and City Council in the actual debating chamber of Glasgow's magnificent city chambers, a wonderful survival uh, from the days when Glasgow was the second city of an empire on which the sun never set. Today, thanks to COVID-19, this is impossible. But thanks to today's wonderful technology, we are unable to do so online. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call upon the Right Honourable the Lord Provost of Glasgow, Councillor Philip Rett, to say a few words. Tonight, I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to the 2021 Mullen Diner Lecture, which has been presented annually from Glasgow City Chambers since 2012. This year, of course, due to the current pandemic, the trustees of the Medieval Glasgow Trust are bringing this lecture to us virtually. This year's lecture is being presented on the Feast of St Mungo, which falls on the 13th of January, which is a significant civic event for our city, as we all remember our patron saint, and the founding of our wonderful city. This lecture also provides a platform for Glasgow citizens and visitors to reflect on the growth and development of St Mungo's settlement of Iglesco on the Mullen Diner, which would grow into modern Glasgow that we know and love today. I am pleased to welcome, of course, the trustees and subscribers to the Medieval Glasgow Trust, but also all of you, our virtual audience for the evening. And the redeeming feature of a virtual lecture is that we can be joined by a truly international audience. I am therefore also delighted to welcome our guests from across the United Kingdom and Ireland and as far afield as Canada, America and Australia, as well as anyone in the world with a fondness and affinity for Glasgow and St Mungo. This year's lecture is entitled Coinage and Coining It in Glasgow. I am delighted that our guest speaker this evening will be Roderick Alexander McPherson, about whom undoubtedly more later. Roderick 
will be taking us through the fascinating journey of coinage and coining it in Glasgow over the last thousand years. It promises to be an exhilarating talk. Over the last few days, I have sent civic greetings to the city of St Asaph in Wales, where St Mungo spent many years as a refugee before returning to Glasgow. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I extend to you all a very warm welcome. Enjoy the lecture. And as St Mungo would say, let Glasgow flourish. Sir, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the overall purpose of the Medieval Glasgow Trust is to promote interest and enjoyment of the medieval history and significance of Glasgow. And that includes what Glasgow and Glaswegian have achieved and are achieving as a result of these foundations in the centuries to date. Last year, we had the honour of listening to Dr. Tristram Hunt of the Victoria and Albert Museum. This year, as we have heard from Lord Provost Philip, we will have the privilege of hearing one of Glasgow's most distinguished citizens tell us something about coining it in the city of St. Mungo. Roderick McPherson, or as I know him better, Roddy, uh, runs one of Glasgow's best known and most significant owner-managed businesses the firm of messengers at arms and sheriff officers called Rutherford and McPherson, who have practiced out of the same premises in Glasgow since 1905. In the professional life of his primary calling, Roddy is a member of the advisory council on messengers at arms and sheriff officers, and he is a former president of their society. I first met Roddy and his wife Christine many years ago at a Glasgow Highland Club ball, where I was a guest and he was the secretary before going on to become the president. His long connection with Glasgow goes back for many generations, and like me, he is a former priestess of the Grand Antiquities Society, an association going back to 1756 for people who can trace their contemporary burgeonship of Glasgow back for three or more generations. Neither of us, I'm pleased to say, looked as if we went back in person to 1756. Uh, Roddy is a member of the incorporation of bonnet makers and dyers of Glasgow, one of the 14 constituencies of the Trades House of Glasgow, an integral part of Glasgow's civic government until 1975, and where the deacon convener of the trades still holds a very distinguished ceremonial role. Roddy's interest in money is it merely pecuniary, as we are about to find out. He is a distinguished numismatist, in which capacity he served alongside the current deacon of the bonnet makers and dyers of Edinburgh, Professor Keith Rutter, whom I'm delighted to know is intending to visit us tonight, uh, as an organising member of the 14th International Numismatic Congress held in Glasgow in 2009. Roddy's first formal association with the ancient art of heraldry came about at the age of only 23 when he was appointed a messenger at arms by Scotland's senior herald and heraldic judge at the right honourable Lord Lyon King of Arms. Since then he's gone on to become the Mesa to the court of the Lord Lyon and since 2018 he has himself been a heraldic member of the court with the title of Falkland Parchment Extraordinary. With such a range of talents and interests, Roddy is more of a Renaissance man than a man of the Middle Ages, and it now gives me very much pleasure, as one of Roddy's friends and as a member of the Medieval Glasgow Trust, to ask him to tell us something about coins and coining it in Glasgow. Good evening, everyone. The Burgess Song of Glasgow, being a 20th century composition, sings appropriately of the vanished Molyneux. 
Let me begin by adding my thanks to those that are due to the inaugurators of this annual lecture for having delivered the sainted rivulet from its culverted confinement. I feel very honoured to have been asked to give this lecture. Glasgow Burgess, humble fellow as I, as I am, and when first invited, it came to me just clean af luft. No prospect could be finer than to give the latest Mullen Diner. Now, the song uh, continues about a uh, bell, the bird and tree, the fish and ring, their charms remain on the Glasgow Arms. And as well as inviting a Glasgow Burgess, you've invited one of the officers of arms extraordinary to speak to you uh, this evening. And so I suppose it is expected that I say something armorial. And let me perhaps make a point rather mischievously. The first time I really uh, noticed the Glasgow Arms was from a, a book a book in early childhood which was always accessible on the shelves at home and on the spine it said Glasgow Ancient and Modern and on the inside cover it called it Glasgow Fasquies and it was the edited version of the histories of Glasgow beginning with John McEwers published in 1736 as edited by the redoubtable Reverend Dr. J. F. S. Gordon, a prolific uh, amateur antiquary and also a most prolific baptizer of Glasgow babies. Uh, his work was published in 1872, and he was uh, the incumbent of St Andrews by the Green until 1890, and he said he had baptized 40,000 babies, uh, each their parents having, as a sign of their faith, having presented half a crown. So there's a, a, my first reference to coining it in, in Glasgow. But Dr. Gordon's treatment of the Glasgow Arms is a, a, li a little bit, a little bit naughty uh, because he reprints the, uh, the patent from the uh, public register of all arms and bearings dated in the year of grace 1866. It was not until 1866 that the ensign arboreal of the city of Glasgow were recorded at uh, Lion Office, and he mentions the shield, which is of, of ancient standing, and he mentions the supporters, two salmon proper, each holding in its mouth a signet ring or. And Dr. Gordon refers to those supporters as two drunken salmon, and prints uh, an extract from a privately printed work of 1869 by one Mr. A.D. Robertson, and Mr. Robertson is praised for having produced a more tasteful version of the Glasgow Arms, and Dr. Gordon thinks an adjudication of superiority is possible for the work of this Mr. Uh, Robertson uh, instead of the work of the Lord Lion King of Arms uh, himself, uh, the supporters as given by Mr. Robertson, as I remember from early childhood, are uh, the Dexter supporter, King Roderick. This is uh, King Ridrich Hale, but in English, Roderick the Generous. And somehow, like the shield of Glasgow, there has a ring to it. But there, on the Dexter side, King Roderick, uh, with a sword, royally robed, and on the sinister, his queen, Queen Langworth. Uh, now, King Roderick seems to get a very bad press from our uh, legend of Glasgow. He sounds a bit of an ogre, and yet I think of him as a, as a bright uh, hero. Uh, he was, after all, it was, it was said that the king who, victorious in battle, allowed for the survival or development of Christianity in uh, Strathclyde. It was he who uh, sent the message to uh, Mungo then in his new seat in Wales, return to Glasgow, return to Glasgow. And according to the hagiography, uh, Mungo did indeed return uh, from Wales, back to his first sea in Glasgow, accompanied by 665 companions. And the biblically numerous amongst you will have realised how careful they must have been not to have picked up one more hanger on. 
Um, so there it is, King Roderick, I remember from childhood and uh, thinking that the version of the Glasgow Arms with him and with his mighty sword, Dernwyn, one of the 13 wonders of Britain, uh, did indeed make a, 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 a lovely uh, armorial design. But there it is, now that uh, I am a, a person extraordinary, I know how serious it would be to go uh, publishing bogus heraldry. Now, not only have you invited me as a, an officer of arms, I have a particular name as an officer of arms, and I'm Falkland Perseverant. Uh, what is there to be said about Falkland and Glasgow? Well, here I'll show you a very scruffy photograph of me taking a picture of an embroidery from Falkland uh, Palace. Uh, the reason for relevance being that it hangs on the walls of Provence Lordship. But I needn't have bothered because there are, there are more interesting connections between Falkland and medieval Glasgow. Uh, James Beaton, Archbishop in 1508 of Glasgow, uh, before his appointment here, was the keeper of Falkland Palace. Indeed, the Beatons were hereditary keepers of Falkland Palace during the uh, 16th century. And just to bring matters even more closely to home for Archbishop Conti, uh, I think of the Archbishop's Palace, if I may so term it, in leafy Newlands. The lands of Newlands and Langside and other in those parts were the property of Archbishop Beaton uh, until the year 1527, I believe, when he sold them to the Earl of uh, Eglinton. Now, in having mentioned uh, the uh, uh, Beatons, I am reminded of an occasion in 1997 uh, when I had the honour to be uh, chairing a public meeting in the Merchants Hall at which the current uh, incumbent of the Archbishopric of Glasgow and a cardinal uh, was the uh, lecturer. And I began the lecture uh, with these words. In the Reformation, Scotland's cardinal was beaten, but now he's winning. Now, that little uh, aphorism I must not allow to be a source of too much pride. Uh, I remember that immortal line in Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan, words are wise men's counters. They do but reckon by them but they are the money of fools. And so I'd better be very sure that I've got a good reckoning of having come up with that particular anecdote uh, about the Cardinal. And my reckoning is, is twofold. Firstly, firstly, uh, because I want to show you this evening some objects about Glasgow, which I think are very interesting. And the last of the objects that I'm going to be describing comes from the Merchant's House of Glasgow. It hangs just outside the, uh, the door to the Merchant's uh, Hall. And it's the board of entitled Scripture Rules for Buying and Selling. We can date it to around 1695. And I think it is a fascinating object. The second reason for my having given you the anecdote of uh, Cardinal Winning's uh, lecture in the Merchant's Hall is that it grounds us in George Square. And that's where I want to be because it was supposed that this year's uh, Mullendine lecture would be taking place where all the other lectures have taken place on the other side of George Square in the city chambers and in the council chamber itself. And it was that invitation to be speaking in the council chamber, which did have a bearing upon my choice of topic for you uh, this, this evening. I remember the last time I spoke in the council chamber was just over 30 years ago, the 6th of April, 1990. That glorious time to be a Glaswegian when Glasgow was the cultural capital of Europe, no less. And I had the uh, pleasure of being the president of the host society, the host 
Numismatic Society in Glasgow, welcoming the British Association of Numismatic Societies. And numismatists, as you'll know, are the people who are terribly interested in coins. So you see exactly where uh, coinage and coining it has, has come from. And on that occasion, I gave a lecture about the history of the Glasgow Mint. And in thinking about Glasgow and coinage, I realized that, well, there were some important points I want to put across in this lecture. And the first one is that from the point of view of the study of coinage, Glasgow is an important place. I think of the year uh, 2009, when the International Numismatic Congress was held in Glasgow. Let me explain the significance of that. The International Numismatic Congress is a gathering of, for the main of professional academic numismatists. Uh, it has, uh, a Congress has been held every six years, starting from the year 1891, and it always meets in a capital city, except when they came to Glasgow. And the importance of uh, Glasgow numismatically could be expressed in one word, hunter, or make it uh, adjectival, hunterian. And the uh, 2009 International Numismatic Congress was hosted by the University of Glasgow and the Congress under the direction of the most admirable curator of coins, Dr. Donald Bateson. And I'm delighted to uh, pay my tribute to uh, the recently retired uh, curator of coins, Donald Bateson, uh, who, when I was a teenager, put me to work as a youthful opportunity uh, in the coin room uh, at the Hunterian. I must also thank his successor, Jesper Eriksson, uh, curator of coins, for his help in providing illustrations for the, uh, this lecture. What makes it particularly timely for me to be able to speak about coinage is because I want to mention a really good news story about Glasgow. And that is the wonderful donation by Lord Stuart Bay of his collection of Scottish coins to the uh, Hunterian. Uh, what a shame that Lord Stuart Bay, having made his uh, donation in 2017, and here is a photograph of him handing over his collection of Scottish coins uh, to the uh, Chancellor of, the, of Glasgow University, uh, Sir Kenneth Kalman. Uh, what a shame that uh, Lord Stuart Bay was to die just a year later in March 2018. Uh, to anyone interested in Scottish coins, Ian Stewart, uh, as, uh, as he was known until 1992 when he became Lord Stewart Bay, uh, Ian Stewart was the towering figure, uh, always an, an, an amateur numismatist, not a professional. His career was in banking and as a member of parliament and as a minister in, in Mrs. Thatcher's government, as I, as I recall. Uh, but absolutely the towering figure in Scottish numismatics. He produced what is still regarded as the most serviceable handbook on the Scottish coinage when he was still at school. He was publishing something every year from 1952 until uh, his death, uh, and his, his in death is indeed a great loss. Now, you may remember from the news that Lord Stuart Bay's coin collection was stolen. In 2007, thieves did indeed break into his Scottish home and took part of his coin collection. It was part of the coin collection, not all of it, because Lord Stuart Bay's collection of coins that he uh, has given to the University of Glasgow extends to some 6,000 coins. 
an extremely important uh, donation. Uh, Dr. Hunter spent 13 years building up his uh, remarkable collection of coins. Of course, he covered all sorts of series and he uh, spent the vast sum of 23,000 pounds sterling on building up uh, his collection. Uh, Lord Stuartby spent 75 years building up that collection of Scottish coins, 6,000 of which are now here in Glasgow as a donation. But what has not been recovered is that portion of his collection of Scottish coins that was stolen in 2007. And what is uh, sad to relate is that, shall we say, from the archaeological point of view, that portion of the collection was much the most precious, starting around about 1136, when the Scots coinage begins, an English invention because King David I captured Carlisle and with it captured a working mint. And the coins that are missing go right up to 1280 in the reign of Alexander III, when Alexander III commenced a new coinage. And from the new coinage onwards, you will find examples in the Hunterian uh, from the Stuart Bay collection but before that you will not find them. Now, uh, in terms of Glasgow numismatically as a source of coins, two coins were found in the year 1908. And these coins were very important because they were pennies of Alexander III's uh, 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 long double cross coinage. And after the moneyer's name, the mint name appeared, and the letters were clearly uh, written G L A S. Two pennies found in 1908 with that full reading. Now, for centuries before, it has been known that there was a mint at Glasgow during the reign of Alexander III. There were pennies which said Walter on G. Walter on GL and Walter on GLA. Now you see, it was important that those pennies were found in 1908 saying GLAS because glands uh, had its advocates. Those two pennies were found in Brussels. And uh, I've spoken about Euro European cities of culture and capitals. So let me, let me plant this part of the story in Brussels. Uh, not only were those two found, but the best part of 100 pennies of Alexander III from Glasgow were found in Brussels. And the circumstances were that workmen were knocking down an old tavern and found a cauldron, and within the cauldron were the better part of 100 pennies from Glasgow. Now, when I give that account to you of the great Brussels hoard, uh, you will... Uh, realize that somewhat playfully, I am aping the style of uh, the reported headline, apocryphal as it is, on the sinking of the Titanic, Aberdeen man drowned at sea. Uh, because those 100 or so pennies of Glasgow formed part of a portion of some 2,000 pennies issued by King Alexander III of Scots, and those 2,000 pennies from Scotland, as found in Brussels, uh, were outnumbered to the sum of 80,000 by pennies of the English king. And altogether, the hoard of coins found in that cauldron numbered some 150,000. And if you're interested, you can go to the Guinness World Records and you will find that is recorded as the biggest deliberately uh, hidden hoard ever to have been uh, discovered. Uh, Glasgow numismatically is not, it's not so much a, a, an important mint. The, the output from uh, Glasgow during the reign of Alexander III was not one of the major ones. The major mints in the reign of Alexander III were Berwick, Roxburgh, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Perth. But Glasgow is our mint. And tonight for a modern diner lecture, we celebrate that which is ours in our, in our dear green uh, place. And the significance 
of discussion about Glasgow as a mint, I suppose turns much upon the possibility that the striking of money in Glasgow was part of the privileges of the bishop. Now, certainly it is true to say that the bishops of St Andrews had the right of striking coins. And uh, Wint Winton's uh, Chronicle says that King Alexander III in the year 1283 in the Kirk at the high altar freely to God and to St Andrew, he granted the striking of money. Um, and it was thereby continuing privileges, it is suggested, that had been held in the reign at least of King Alexander III. And there's a golden chart of 1483, which confirms the Bishop of St Andrew's right to strike money, uh, and another one in 1553. Uh, and of course, the striking of money was a source of profit, although you had to be uh, run a very tight uh, ship uh, in uh, striking money, and everything needed to be um, uh, measured perfectly. Otherwise, there would have been considerable uh, losses on going through the process of striking money because the value of the silver in bullion was crucial. And the fact that 150,000 pennies could all be found in a cauldron in Brussels gives you an idea that what they had all in common was they were all penny size. They all had the king's head on one side and whatever the inscription was, they bore faith as being worth, worth the money in silver. Let me return to Dr. William Hunter and show you one of the great treasures of the uh, Hunterian uh, Museum. This golden noble uh, issued by King David II. Uh, we know the purchase price for this. It was 21 pounds sterling in 1780, a huge price. It's simply described as a Scotch David well, for £21, it must be this coin. It's one of the rarest of the Scottish coins. It is a magnificent uh, specimen. Uh, and uh, it represents uh, the copying of the Scots of the English pattern because King Edward III had very recently issued a coin almost to exactly the same design. It's the first example of a, of a gold coin being struck in Scotland. And Armorially, it's significant because it's the first time that the lion rampant uh, within the tressure, double tressure, appears on a Scottish coin. Something very wonderful uh, happened in opening the British Numismatic Journal in 2015 when there was published an article uh, showing a detectorist's, a detectorist's find of a farthing from Suffolk. A farthing of King Alexander III, amazingly, not having the king's portrait on it. Because all the coins of Alexander III have the king's portrait on it. But on this unique coin, there's a little lion rampant. So it is amazing what is still being found. There, there wasn't any hint uh, through the records of the coinage of Scotland, of there ever having been such a coin, having a lion on it from the reign of Alexander III. And that's a point that the past is very unpredictable. Now, I've been paying tribute to Ian Stewart, Ian Stewart Lord Stewartby, for his contribution to the Hunterian through his donation of 2017. But even from a much earlier date, uh, we Glaswegians are much indebted to him. In 1991, the Hunter coin cabinet lacked any example of a Glasgow penny. And Dr. Stewart, as he then was, uh, gave one to the Hunterian. And also, a few years later, made sure that a most remarkable penny found its home at the Hunterian. And here's an illustration of the, of the coin. It is a penny of Alexander III. And what is, makes it uh, unique is that on the reverse, at the tail side, uh, there is a short cross. 
and round the inscription reads Robert on Gla, G-L-A. Now, this makes it remarkable for two reasons. One is that the only Manier who was known to have been working at Glasgow was hitherto Walter, Walter on Gla, and uh, the significance of Robert is very interesting. It means these are moneyers who were working at several mints uh, of King Alexander III. Alexander III uh, didn't just concentrate the mint in a few places. He had places of mintage numbering 16 at least. And what we see is that Walter and Robert are working at other mints than Glasgow. That may or may not be significant in the discussion that I raised for you about whether Glasgow was an Episcopal uh, mint. The other thing that's uh, amazing about this coin is that it has the short cross. There's a distinction uh, in, in Alexander III's uh, uh, coinages as follows. They start with short cross coins, uh, then the crosses uh, become long cross coins, but they are voided. Uh, the reason for the void was that if you wanted a half penny or a farthing, you just cut the coin up. But of course, you had to be very careful to cut very neatly through the void because you didn't want to be guilty of uh, defacing the cross. Uh, the purpose of extending the cross from the, uh, the inner, from the inner legend to the circumference of the coin uh, was, and so it said, to dissuade people from the nefarious practice of clipping coins, a means of having your cake and eating it by taking shavings of silver, but still being able to pass the coin, much uh, thereby depriving the king or the bishop of his profit in being able to remake the coin at a new coinage. Uh, then the last coinage of Alexander III is a long uh, cross, a long single cross coinage, which perfectly reflects the innovation of King Edward I of England. And you will have seen Scotland follow what England was doing in coinage. The lovely thing about this coin that you see is we can date it precisely. We can date it to 1249, to 1250. And the reason for being able to be so precise is Alexander III became king as a boy in 1249. And what you can see, although the portrait is not the clearest of the coins, but what you can see on the portrait is this is a, a, a youthful face, not a bewhiskered face, such as one finds on the coins of Alexander II, but a King Alexander with a fresh, smooth face. And the other thing, of course, is you see the short cross coin. And in the uh, Scottish Chronicon, we learn that in 1250, the form of the Scottish coin was changed and the cross, which hitherto went to the inscription, was carried to the circumference of the coin. So there it is, beautifully datable as 1249 to 50 and the earliest coin that we can say was made at Glasgow. Now, uh, what sort of an institution uh, was the mint at Glasgow? Was it a case of the moneyer following round the king at a place of sojourn, carrying some uh, um, dyes with the uh, king and striking off as many coins as were wanted? Or was there actually an institution, a, a house, a building with a staff uh, the answer is, so far as Glasgow is concerned, we do not know. What we do know, and uh, going back to the King David II, who's had an honourable mention already, is that it's with King David II that we get the first letters patent being granted to the warden of the Canihus, the Scots minting house, the Canihus, in this case the Canihus of Edinburgh, and to the master moneyers and to the other uh, tradesmen and officials of the mint. And later uh, charters about the money refer to King David's time in having first established uh, a 
the establishment of a Scottish Mint. So there it is. It's in Edinburgh at that, at that point. It wasn't the only place where coins were made, but Edinburgh becomes very much the coinage capital of Scotland. And it's not surprising that if you want to find St. Aloy's Isle, St. Aloy, patron saint of coin makers, you have to go to Edinburgh and to uh, St. Giles. You don't find that in Glasgow uh, Cathedral. But we do not know uh, what sort of an establishment there might have been in Glasgow. Uh, but in presenting the next item of interest for your consideration, I return to that book, the uh, edition of Dr. J.F.S. Gordon. At its heart, a reprinting of McEwer's first history of Glasgow from 1736. And in particular to the second uh, volume and to the reference to there having been a mint house in Glasgow. And let me read the passage to you. So this is McEwer in 1736. There has been a mint house here also, as was in most of the considerable boroughs, for some of the coins of King Robert III bear to have been stamped here and have the king's picture crowned but without a scepter and Robertus de Gracia Rex Cotoro. In the inner circle, Villa de Glasgow and on the outer, Dominus Protector, some of which are preserved in the cabinets of the curious and some were found lately by masons among the rubbish of the office house, as Mr. Russell informs me, who is governor of the correction house. You can see from this page in the book, an illustration of the dry gate, which of course has been part of old Glasgow, is a, is a convincing enough place, I suppose, for the location. And I'll call attention also to the 1830 edition of McEwer, a little footnote. And Dr. Gordon, you missed publishing this footnote, although you were so careful with your scissors and paste in so many other respects. Uh, on the subject of the king's picture crowned, but without a scepter, this footnote appears. There is one in the possession of a gentleman of this city with the scepter. Well, I think the example which is referred to in that edition of McEwer in 1830 is the coin that you see on the screen. Uh, it purports to be a groat of a King Robert uh, issued at Glasgow. It is a donation from Lord Stuart B. And I think it's one of the most interesting things from our Glaswegian point of view, although numismatically speaking, it is utterly valueless. Let me, let me explain. The description that we read uh, in McEwen, uh, fits accurately the design of groats of King Robert III. A facing head, as was now the English style, a facing crowned head without a scepter on the obverse, and on the reverse, the legend is correctly stated in that account by McEwer. And he says, there were examples of those coins found and that they existed in his own time. And I think it's quite significant to give an honorable mention here to uh, R. W. Cochran Patrick, uh, uh, another uh, pioneer in the study of Scots coinage, who in 1876 published the records of the coinage of Scotland, and in his introduction, he quotes fully the passage that I've read you from McEwer's History of Glasgow. He mentions that there's uh, a coin that is illustrated already in a book that was current, which is clearly a forgery. But on the basis of the description by McEwer, uh, Cochran Patrick supposes that these coins may be found one day, and therefore, he counts Glasgow as a place of mintage during the reign of King Robert III, therefore at the very, the very uh, start of the 15th uh, century, given the style of coin that we're talking about. But I said, numismatically speaking, uh, the coin uh, that you see is valueless. Uh, Ian Stewart, as he then was, 
when I asked his opinion uh, on that coin, said he considered it a 19th century, possibly 18th century invention. It's quite instructive to see quite what the producer of this item uh, has done. Uh, in the first place, it's ended up being noted in history books in the 1830s. And in 1868, an outline drawing of what I think is probably this very piece appears in Lindsay's second supplement to the coinage of Scotland. And here you see it on the, on the screen. Uh, everything is wrong with this coin. In the first place, the obverse uh, appears to be a groat of Robert II. We know it's Robert II, and uh, the B behind the, uh, the king's head uh, is, stands for the money of Bonagius, uh, but in this case it stands for B for bogus. The um, stepter doesn't look at all right, uh, and altogether it does not look right. Uh, the reverse is no less fun to consider. Uh, it gives an abbreviated version of the outer legend that is suitable for a half groat. Uh, and in showing the pellets at the centre of the cross uh, rather than mullets, uh, it presents itself as being a coin of Robert III, whereas, as I've said, the obverse is obviously of Robert uh, II. And what's also uh, bizarre is that the legend uh, Villa de Glasgow starts in the wrong place because it should have started in, periodically speaking, in the second quarter, uh, that's as it were, at, tw at 12 o'clock, whereas in fact it starts at 6 o'clock. So altogether this is an intriguing concoction and I can only think it's a sign of the interest of the curious uh, who had their cabinets in the 18th century and were no doubt very interested to know that Glasgow, which was such a rising and interesting and historically significant uh, city, uh, could claim to be a point of interest in coinage, uh, not just in the reign of Alexander III, but of Robert III. Well, there it is. I incline to the view of Cochrane Patrick that authentic coins will one day turn up. It's significant, perhaps, that uh, King Robert III did have a place of mintage at Dumbarton. So it, it does make sense, but there it is. It is very much a conversation piece and a piece which has been donated for our enjoyment uh, to the Hunterian. Well, having mentioned Dr. Gordon's half crowns, uh, the treasure of Dr. Hunter, so far as Scots coinage is concerned, the noble of David II, uh, the strikings of authentic pennies during the reign of Alexander III here at Glasgow, and uh, the creation of uh, ex ex exotic antiquarian objects of interest uh, in the 18th or 19th century to satisfy the interests of the uh, curious. I've said enough about coinage at this point, and let me turn to coining it in, uh, money-making in Glasgow. And I go back to the significance of the Merchant's House of Glasgow, uh, the home of the amazing board. And here is the board that I'm, I'm speaking of with such, uh, with such enthusiasm. Scripture rules uh, on buying and selling. The board is not dated, but uh, sources uh, in the Merchant's House have always uh, given it the date of around 1695, which is when the artist William Waddle was doing other work uh, in the uh, Merchant's House of Glasgow. Uh, it's an amazing uh, work of composition. It's also an amazing piece of execution, uh, the calligrapher's art, uh, so carefully painted. And on the left, uh, we have, I might even call them the Ten Commandments. There are ten, ten paragraphs on the subject of buying, rules on buying. And on the right, there are ten uh, paragraphs dealing with the rules for selling on the right. And uh, there is some connection with coinage in that amongst the buying, uh, the merchant is told on no account to pass counterfeit coins, even if you've accepted them in good faith whilst giving uh, commodities. If you know that uh, your gold is but brass, 
uh, you must not pass counterfeit coins. To give you uh, some flavour of the, uh, the work of the, the composition, however, I'll read you first the first uh, rule on buying, and then I'll read you the first rule on selling. Rules concerning buying commodities. The first one. If you would not transgress scripture rules in buying, then first take heed that you do not discommend those commodities that are very good, which you are about to buy, and so you may bring down the price of the commodity and get it for less than it is worth. There is a known place of scripture for this in Proverbs 20, 14. It is not, it is not, saith the buyer, but when he has gone his way, when then he boasteth. And let me read from the first rule concerning selling commodities. If you would not transgress scripture rules in selling commodities, then in the first place, do not multiply words in selling. If you think good, saith God, give me my price. If not, forbear. Multiplicity of words is needless. In a multitude of words, saith Solomon, there is sin. And then it adds, quite in the spirit of our uh, COVID-19 age, men should not lavish and frolic in a shop. But the most significant rule and the reason why I particularly want to share this object uh, with you concerns the tenth rule of buying. And it says, do not buy those things which are not fit to be bought and sold. It gives examples and then adds these lines. Do not buy men for slaves. For this the Lord reproves in Amos 2, 6, they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. And so in Deuteronomy 2, 7, thou shalt not steal thy brother and make merchandise of him. This, as I've said, is a board put up in the merchant's house, dated to 1695. And when James uh, Denham, in his uh, History of Glasgow, published in the uh, later 18th century, uh, noticed it was not there on display, he supposed that the merchants of his time uh, were conducting their business according to a different monitor. Uh, one fears the power of the bank balance being the monitor, uh, the business ledger, instead of the rules that had been put up in the previous century. The board, I think, is significant uh, in, first of all, in having as given us, as it were, a gloss on scripture, uh, a change, in fact, because uh, the reference to Deuteronomy is not entirely accurate. It actually comes from 24-7, not 2-7. And it is a paraphrase of Deuteronomy 24, 7. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel and maketh merchandise of him or selleth him, then that thief shall die. It's therefore, as painted on the Glasgow board, taken out of context. The context being in Deuteronomy chapter 23's teaching on usury. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury. So what we have in Glasgow, this amazing uh, creation and a public declaration of the brotherhood of all men in display, on display in Glasgow. Now, of course, the Glasgow merchants were overlooking what they knew about within Scotland, and that was the state of slavery, really, the slavery of the colliers and the salters, 
uh, who would not get their uh, liberty from bondage until the uh, acts of 1775 and 1799. And I suppose the merchants of Glasgow in 1695 uh, could little have anticipated the uh, African plight of the Africans uh, being taken to the West Indies as slaves. But how significant that the abolitionists of the slave trade uh, came up with the emblem of the African saying, am I not a man and a brother, which proved so highly uh, persuasive and led to the abolition of the slave trade within the British Empire in the year 1807. And here's a picture of a coin to celebrate that 1807. I'm sure there must be one in the Hunterian Museum because 1807 is also the year that Dr. Hunter's coins uh, were brought to Glasgow by road in a mighty wagon, carefully guarded by six trusty men accustomed to the use of arms bringing that treasure to Glasgow in 1807 and the Hunterian becoming the first and oldest public museum in Glasgow. But much more significant is 1807, as recorded on that coin, uh, the year uh, of the abolition of the slave trade. Uh, it's much to the discredit of Glasgow that 100 years after that board uh, was produced, 1795, the abolition of Alexander Houston and Company uh, caused uh, a sensation in Glasgow, not because the creditors lost any money. In fact, the assets of the partners were quite sufficient to meet all the liabilities. And those partners included the Lord Provost of Glasgow and the Lord Lieutenant of Renfrewshire. What, of course, to us is so uh, sickening about it was that one of the reasons for that mercantile failure was a speculation on the price of slaves in anticipation of the abolition of the slave trade in 1795. And we think of it as a great outrage to buy slaves and make them work. And let us think of it as being an even greater injustice to have bought slaves and then not fed them. Uh, a situation much to the discredit of, of Glasgow. Uh, and one for which I suppose in our own ways, we do our best. We realize the past is another country, but we're mindful also of the uh, responsibility uh, to be able to do our bit. I was very uh, pleased to be able to attend a Zoom lecture organized by the Grand Antiquity Society of Glasgow in November. And the lecturer was Sir Jeff Palmer, who is a, a worldwide authority on the subject of malt and on much else. And he, of course, is famous as being uh, the first black professor in Scotland and now uh, a knight of the realm. There was one uh, anecdote that uh, uh, Sir Jeff mentioned that struck me very much. And his manner was so uh, gentle and engaging. And he wasn't calling attention to this uh, with any sense of, of uh, lightning or thunderclap. Uh, but he mentioned how he had to deliver a lecture and uh, he turned up early at the lecture hall because he wanted to be sure of the uh, preparations for delivery on this big occasion. And he met the very charming young person uh, who was in charge of the venue. And he said, I've just come to check. I'm here to give a lecture at three o'clock. And he mentioned the reply that he'd received, which was, I'm sorry, I think there must be some mistake because Professor Sir Jeff Palmer is giving the lecture at three o'clock. Now I've mentioned quite a lot of my heroes of old, King Roderick the Generous, uh, Dr. William Hunter and Lord Stuart Bing. Uh, that's a lot of men. Let me uh, give some gender balance here and say that Glasgow has produced two of the most eminent numismatists who happen to have been women. And I'm thinking particularly of Professor Anne Robertson, uh, curator of coins at the Hunterian, and of Marion Archibald, 
uh, one of the keepers of coins at the British Museum. And uh, with great pleasure, I think back to an occasion in the days of the Glasgow and West of Scotland Numismatic Society. I think it was our 40th anniversary in 1987. And I had the opportunity to propose a toast to those two ladies seated at the top table. And the toast was to the Glasgow girls. I think also of a very significant numismatist, a woman. And I remember Mrs. Joan Murray with great fondness. She was with us in Glasgow on the occasion of the British Association of Numismatic Societies uh, Congress. And I very much appreciated some letters for, from her. And uh, she said, dear Mr. McPherson, I think naturally of you as Roddy, but as there is such a big age difference, you might not wish to uh, reciprocate. Uh, well, now I always think of her as Joan. She was born in 1917 and she died in 1996. I think of her as Joan because all the world can think of her as Joan because of the imitation game. Now, we always knew that Mrs. Murray had done something, something of interest during the war, but quite what it was was a bit of a secret. Well, technically, it was a secret. Uh, she had been at Bletchley Park, and when you see the 2014 film of The Imitation Game, uh, she is Joan. She is the one who gets engaged to Alan uh, Turing. Uh, she is the one working away as the crypt analyst. And uh, there it is, Joan Clark or Murray, crypt analyst and numismatist, uh, which I think is a nice opportunity to add the the glamour of mentioning, just to remind you, that this is the Kira Knightley uh, character uh, in the film, uh, that code-breaking is really the hallmark, shall we say, of the expert numism numismatist. And the skills of the, of, uh, the code-breaking, as were exemplified in Lord Stuart Bay and in Mrs. Murray, were really, uh, really superb. So I pay tribute to all these highly skilled numismatists. I am but a dilettante, although I'm very glad that I had the opportunity in my teenage years to have a youthful opportunity of working in the Hunterian uh, Museum's coin room. Now, I mentioned that Mrs. Murray worked on the coinage of Robert II. Uh, it's a nice touch that that edition of the British Numismatic Journal in 2015, the last uh, to contain a uh, work uh, by Lord Stuart Lee before, before his death, um, uh, contains his uh, account of Mrs. Murray's classification of the coinage of Robert II. And this is lovely and personal because he mentions that Mrs. Murray had delivered a paper on the subject, but it was incomplete. It wasn't possible to find a text which really clearly gave her classification of the coins of Robert uh, II. He, you'll remember, who produces uh, groats with the letter B for Bernadius uh, behind, the king's, behind the king's head. But Lord Stuart B had lent all his Robert II coins to Mrs. Murray on long-term loan, and she worked over them, and on the basis, having got his coins back, of the comments that she had written on her little paper envelopes, he was able to rebuild her system for the classification of the coins of Robert II. So it was uh, both a very personal tribute uh, to the lady in making sure that the, the monument was put to her uh, work and also a sign of great uh, ingenuity uh, in making sure that all the information available would be properly recorded. Uh, alas for Lord Stuart to have suffered the shock of having those thousand pennies of Scotland, so carefully collected for so many years, stolen. If anyone who ever hears this uh, recording and knows anything about the whereabouts of those coins, do be sure to get in touch with the police. A substantial reward was offered right away and has never been claimed. And what's important to remember is that just like Dr. Hunter, Lord Stuart Bay had an eye to the public and has made a public donation of his coins. 
There's so much for which we should be grateful about Glasgow. There's also so much, I suppose, in which we need to do better. We gather this evening on the 13th of January, and there's better historical reason for us being confident that St Mungo died here in Glasgow on this day, some 1400 years ago, better reason than for supposing that our ancient Glasgow fair was ever meant to be taking place in the second half of July. Thank you for gathering on this special occasion. Thanks to all who have made the 13th of January a red letter day in Glasgow. Uh, growing up in the city, I don't think I was aware of St Mungo's Day, had the work of Reformation gone quite so far as that. But I think it did require uh, uh, an act, of, an act of, of faith and effort uh, to have us focus again on our patron saint. And to all of those who have done so much to make the 13th of January a day of celebration for us in Glasgow, I give my thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, that was an absolutely splendid talk by Roddy. I think you will agree. And the depth of his information and its range, truly enlightening and really most enjoyable. Now, I have a question of my own to ask, but first of all, Rosemary Berger wonders if anybody could give a date uh, when the Earl of Eglinton bought the lands of Newlands and Langside from the Beaton family. Now, I must admit, until you mentioned that, I didn't know that's how they, they passed to the Eglintons. But perhaps you were able to shed some light on that. Thank you, Gordon. And, and indeed, on that subject, the first, the first thing I want to say, having, having put in that, that, that playful remark about the Archbishop's Palace in Leafy, Newlands, of course, uh, what desperately sad news about the death of Archbishop uh, Tertalia this very day on St Mungo's Day. So I just wanted to add my uh, condolences to his uh, family and, of course, to all of the Roman Catholic community in Glasgow in particular about the loss that's been suffered on this particular day. Um, uh, the date that I uh, mentioned, which I will have got from somewhere, was 1527, um, at, at, which, at which point Archbishop uh, Beaton was, uh, at that stage, of course, the, uh, uh, the Archbishop of St Andrews. Uh, and so perhaps the convenience of having the lands of Newlands uh, uh, in his ownership uh, had changed. So um, that, that's my answer to the, to the, uh, the, the question. Uh, I, I didn't uh, continue the, the theme of the uh, importance of, of these famous old Glasgow lands and the significance to them. Uh, probably very few of the inhabitants of Jordan Hill are, are aware of the, uh, uh, the fact of the, perhaps the lands being sold, the lands being sold by the Houston family uh, to deal with the uh, astonishing um, apparent insolvency of that firm that I, that I mentioned in, in 1795. And uh, by, uh, in terms of that, um, the, uh, uh, that very difficult uh, period and aspect of our history in coming to terms with it, uh, to find myself misspeaking and calling it the abolition of Alexander Houston and Company, the apparent insolvency, the firm actually having, having paid out its creditors uh, continued. Um, and as, as I've said, uh, an episode much to the discredit of our dear green place. Well, that, that's all very interesting, uh, Roddy. Um, former deacon of the tailors and deacon convener of the trades of Glasgow, Roy Scott is watching us tonight. And he would find it interesting to hear you mention 1527, because that is the date upon which the incorporation of tailors of Glasgow that first became a corporate body. The, the question uh, I was going to ask uh, re referred to the, uh, the, the, um, the embroidery in um, Provence Lordship uh, from Falkland Palace uh, with uh, a conspicuous letter M on it. And I wondered whether perhaps that might have been made 
by Queen Mary, or perhaps it referred to um, Mary, the Queen of Heaven. Have you any thoughts about that? I wish I could give you more information uh, about it. Um, I think I took a photograph of the label right beside it, but I couldn't find it. And of course, these days, it's not possible to go and look, look in our oldest house uh, to see the, the exhibition. I rather think it didn't uh, specify that it was the uh, work of Mary Queen of Scots because, uh, well, I, even, even in my own home, I have a piece of embroidery of needlework which claims to be the work of Mary Queen of Scots whilst in prison in England. And uh, I have no evidence at all to suppose that it really was, but there it is, it says it on the frame and indeed most bits of embroidery, I suppose, of a certain period and having the letter M uh, will naturally come to be uh, associated with, as you say, either Queen, Queen Mary of Scots or Mary Queen of Heaven. I can't throw any light on it except to, to say these are of course, fascinating conversation pieces. Well, absolutely, Ronnie. And as you say, Queen Mary uh, was a most accomplished and uh, prolific embroideress. She did a, a huge amount of work, and uh, some of it certainly is authenticated and survives. Now, we have two further questions. Um, I'll give you them both first, and you can take them in, in whatever answer you think is best. Uh, the first of them is. How common are fake medieval coins among Scottish coinage? And the other is from an anonymous attendee who lives in Jordan Hill and who wonders if you can provide any more information about Jordan Hill. Thank you. Thank you very much for these, for these questions. Um, on the subject of, of counterfeit uh, 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 coins, um, uh, it's quite interesting in that the, the coin uh, that we described as the Glasgow groat, a King, King Robert uh, groat, uh, when it came to be sold, that very piece that uh, Lord Stuart Bay has given to Glasgow, when it came to be sold in the Cochrane Patrick sale in 1936, it was catalogued as a contemporary forgery, a base metal contemporary forgery. And as, as you'll know, uh, Lord, Lord Stuart Bay quite correctly spotted it. it, it is a, it's, a, it's a concoction. Uh, it's not a copy uh, of contemporary coins. It's something that has been made up uh, on the basis, no doubt, of somebody having seen line drawings of coins of the, of the, of the period. Um, I, I can't uh, give you, the, as it were, the chapter and verse on the numbers of counterfeit coins that might be, might be found in museums. You will generally find that uh, museums or indeed coin dealers always keep a cabinet of uh, forgeries, doubtful pieces, pieces which aren't to be offered to the, uh, the, the public because they can't uh, vouch for the authenticity of them. And uh, some, some, of, some of these uh, uh, cabinets of forgeries can contain some of the most interesting of these uh, pieces mm -hmm. about which we could, we could speak so, uh, so very, very much. Um, I haven't seen a, a lot of counterfeit coins, but if you take, a, uh, if you take a, a medieval pennies, uh, generally, by uh, dropping them uh, on on a, a hard surface, um, if the sound is terribly flat, you may be pretty sure that it's a it's a coin which has got far too much lead in it. Uh, there should be a certain jingle uh, in our money. That's what that's what we recognise as being a, a goodly sign, and that's that's certainly one way to be able to uh, spot a, a, a distinct forgery. Uh, from the subject of the history of Jordan Hill, I am no expert on the on the subject at all, and I'm just calling together the the, uh, the pieces of information about how uh, that business failure was a hundred years after the dating of that uh, amazing board in the Merchant's House, how the Houston family had Jordan Hill as their estate, and how the assets of the partners were realised to pay the debts of that uh, uh, mercantile company. And I call attention to that particular company uh, because the, the, doing our bit, I think, is a following on from the, uh, the, um, uh, the emphasis that we had last year about Black Lives Matter, uh, Sir Jeff Palmer's lecture, which was such an, uh, an important contribution, mm -hmm. I think, to Glasgow life by having considered Glasgow and its links with the uh, slave, slave trade. And uh, it, 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 calls, it calls to mind the fact that these very uh, 
a shrewd and hard-nosed Glasgow businessman speculated in 1795 on the fact that the abolition was going to go through much sooner than in the year 1807. Roddy, we've been talking a bit about forgeries this evening and uh, coining, you might say, and I'm aware that in the law of England, um, forging coins uh, was uh, high treason. And th there were lots of versions of um, felonies and, 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 and crimes that were high treason. And for men, the uh, traditional uh, punishment for high treason was um, hanging, drawing and quartering. And for women, it was to be burnt alive, which apparently still continued into the 18th century. Can you say anything about such coins and the, such um, crimes and the punishment in Scotland? Because I know nothing about them, I'm pleased to say. Well, well uh, Gordon, thank you for introducing that, that particularly gruesome note into our, into our uh, 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 evening. Um, uh, certainly for clipping, the uh, traditional punishment was the cutting off of the hand. And as you say, the, the uh, forgery, forgery uh, uh, of forging coins uh, could lead to uh, capital, capital offence. Uh, so it's, um, I'm very grateful to my friend, I think she's, she's listening, Leanne Mitchell, who uh, has just directed me to a song uh, called The King of the Coiners. Uh, and it's, it's about a, a, a clipper. Uh, that was that was how he made that was how he made his money by clipping clipping coins. So uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, part, I suppose, about crime and uh, punishment. And given the uh, as we know about the, the that part of the past, given the difficulty in detecting crime, uh, so much uh, more serious were the penalties. And um, uh, it's a grisly topic. Mm -hmm. Uh, absolutely. And, and thinking about it a little bit further, I, I do recall having read somewhere in the proceedings of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland um, that the penalties in Scotland tended to be rather less than that, because rather like in England, the juries tended to wish to acquit people who were accused of capital crimes rather than seeing them um, suffer in, in that way. Now, oh, Gordon, if, Gordon, if ever I'm up on a charge, I will get you to be my lawyer. <laughs> that was never my area of expertise, Roddy. Uh, <laughs> charities of succession and things like that were more my style. But another question has come in um, about um, the board behind you, um, referred to by the questioner as in the trades hall, which of course it, it's... Uh, it's part of the, the merchant's house uh, furnishing. And that is uh, whether there's a reference to buying and selling of slaves as such. And does it even include profiting through the results of the slave trade, such as in the profits from tobacco and cotton trades, etc.? So um, are you able to say a word or two about, uh, about that aspect of the board, Roddy? Well, it, it, cert it certainly uh, exhorts the uh, buyers and sellers not to enter into sin and not to uh, buy things uh, the buying of will be related to services which are, which are sin. Uh, so uh, whilst it, it says nothing more on the subject of slavery than I quoted to you, it does uh, certainly uh, exhort uh, the traders uh, only to be dealing in objects which are fit to be dealt with so that they are not um, going to be uh, uh, leading themselves or others into uh, sin. And um, the, the date of that board, I, I guess, uh, uh, circa 1695. And on the subject of, of, of dates, uh, I, I found myself uh, misspeaking once again when I mentioned the date of, of, of 19, 91 for uh, Dr. Stewart's uh, first donation of a penny of Alexander III. Uh, I don't know why I said 1991, because I meant 1981. And the, uh, the penny to which I called so much attention, the, the 1249 to 1250 chalk cross penny, uh, was found uh, in, um, at a, a, an auction in 1984. 
and uh, it was very much to the generosity of, of uh, Ian Stewart to make sure that that, that, that coin uh, didn't stay in his own collection, but made, found its home uh, at the Hunterian. Robbie, and thank goodness I have, it had. Mm -hmm. I have a question in with regard uh, to heraldry from Robert Patterson, um, who refers to the flag uh, of the trades house, which uh, he, in which he uh, says depicts the Glasgow coat of arms on a red and white background, and he wonders what significance might attach to the colours. Now, while you're thinking about that, um, I'm aware that in the regalia of the Merchant's House of Glasgow, uh, there is a medal which depicts just such uh, a design, which nowadays um, is the duly matriculated uh, uh, shield part of the armorial achievements of the Trades House of Glasgow with the motto, Union is Strength. And there's also uh, a, a depiction of those arms in the cathedral without the motto, as well as one with it. And over the years, I've come to the conclusion that perhaps that particular version of the arms might simply be a reference to Glasgow in some way, or it might be a reference to Glasgow Gildrey, which included both the merchants and the craftsmen. But uh, Robert's question really was to do with the colours in the field, um, argent and gules. So might, might there be some significance to that that can be explained to us? Yes, and, and th thank you, Gordon, for that, those very interesting remarks on the subject um, of the, uh, the colours of the field. Uh, uh, yes, I'll, I, can, I can answer that, uh, uh, I think. Um, I had mentioned that it wasn't until 1866 that the arms of Glasgow were actually uh, recorded um, in the public, public register, and the field on those arms is argent. Uh, you are talking about, of, of course, a uh, field where uh, parted per face, uh, where there is a line uh, that goes across the shield and one uh, um, colour above, or, or, or rather a metal argent, and with a, a colour uh, below in the lower half of the shield, uh, gules or red. Now, that uh, um, the parted, uh, the, the face, uh, fits with the um, uh, uh, version of the Glasgow arms as seen in McCure's History of Glasgow. And I think that the, uh, we go back to this uh, book of McCure having been the first history, having an illustration of the arms. I think probably it was a very um, influential book from that point of view because people saw what was, was said by McCure to be the Glasgow arms. And I think that probably explains why, as you say, the Lord Dean of Guild's um, uh, badge of office uh, has the same um, uh, parting of the of the of the uh, field uh, and many other coats of arms. And thank you for the questioner who's referred to uh, trades house uh, arms. Uh, I suppose it does uh, work out well because it's a, a means of differencing those organisations from the arms of the city. Uh, but it so happens that McEwer uh, indicates that this, the city or the town's arms uh, had this, uh, uh, this parting, uh, uh, being parted per face. Thank you very much, Roddy. Uh, and, and that does help a lot in, in explaining how we have the, uh, the current arms, um, where the background is entirely argent and, and doesn't have any uh, other coloration in it at all. Now, our first um, question was to do with the trades uh, nearly, and the last one is as well, Alpha and Omega, and it is from a um, former convener of the trades of Glasgow, uh, Mr. Roy Scott, and he says, um, the Alexander III reverse shot cross coin depicts two horsemen. Now, as you'll be aware, uh, part of the devices of the uh, Order of the Knights Templar had two knights on a horse. And Roy wonders whether this depiction of uh, these two gentlemen on the Alexander III coin could have any connection to the Order of the Temple 
who, as you know, uh, were big in the realm of banking uh, up until their terrible uh, bringing to an end. Uh, is there anything that one can say about that, Roddy, please? Well, let, let me say hello, Dr. Scott. Very nice to know that, that, that you're here. Thank you for the question. I'm, I've been aware, you must have wonderful, uh, wonderful spectacles or a very powerful magnifying glass to be able to see two horsemen uh, in the, uh, the penny of, of Alexander III. I've, I've never even seen one. All, all I can see is the, uh, the picture of the king's head and on the, on the uh, reverse, I suppose these stars might, uh, the, or mullets sometimes look like spurs. Um, uh, but I don't think there are two horsemen uh, on the a penny, but uh, I must say from the point of view of the lettering and the like, uh, one has to say quite a lot of the reading has to be taken as a bit of an act of faith. I'm, I'm very grateful to my, uh, uh, my numismatic colleague, John uh, Goddard, uh, who was discussing with me, had I seen the half penny of Alexander III, which had come up for sale uh, just last year in the, in the, in the summer, and it's a Glasgow half penny, a cut half penny, uh, and uh, I, I believe it's perhaps a bit of an act of faith, but I believe I read G L A S and the letter R O B. So uh, another of these uh, amazingly rare uh, finds has just turned up a half penny of the money of Robert, um, showing a different reading, uh, a, a, a fuller reading of Glasgow with an S at the end. Uh, at least I could see there was a letter there and I like to believe it is uh, an S, but it, it, it takes some doing um, uh, what we can see in some of these kinds and uh, bringing out the, um, uh, the, uh, the inscriptions of kinds, particularly with these early uh, uh, medieval kinds, uh, very highly skilled work. And uh, uh, Ian Stewart wrote a wonderful uh, biographical essay about Edward Burns, who wrote the, uh, the largest, to date, the largest work on Scottish coinage, in, published in 1887. And uh, uh, Ian Stewart mentions from one of Burns's letters, he's talking with another uh, numismatist about how he's putting pennies of King David I wrapped in tissue paper into the heel of his shoe and he's walking on the David the first pennies because that was the that was the way to bring out every every possible detail of these medieval kinds. So it, they're not it's not easy always to spot what's in a, a coin. It takes uh, a, a very good eyesight and a lot of patience to be able to get a complete reading. Roddy, thank you so much uh, for not simply your talk but the magnificent way in which you have answered our question and in response to all our queries. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if we had all been together in the city chambers now, uh, I would invite you to give a rousing cheer and loud round of clapping in honour of Roddy. I cannot do that in person, but I would invite you to join with you now, join with me now, in joining your hands together and clapping them out. So thank you once again, Roddy, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you, thank you, Gordon.